everybody and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. We're super excited to have you with us this evening. We've got a great show planned. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And i uh, got a lot of good things for you tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about muscadines, which are kind of a staple of the South and uh, going through all the different you know varieties and, and some little some stories from the past and uh, just a little everything about muscadines. And we'll have our show and tell and answer a few of your questions. What are you pouring up over there? Well, me and we do with muscadines, then uh, I thought I would show people a little bit about some of the juice we make. And uh, and we do ferment some of it. And uh, and then a little later on, I thought I'd give a lesson on how you eat a muscadine because there's proper techniques to doing that. And there is repercussions of doing it the wrong way. Okay. Okay. So that's some... Uh Bronze muscadine. This here is muscadine wine. We got about 25 gallons of brewing right now. And we make a lot of wine. A lot of the primitive Baptists in our area like to use real wine for their communion. Now, I'm pretty sure they don't use a red solo cup, but they do use the real wine. Now, your Southern Baptists won't use real wine. They're going to use grape juice. Right. But if you go back into the Bible, it talks about wine a lot in the Bible. Yeah. You know the difference between a Baptist and a Methodist, don't you? <coughs> yeah, that's good stuff, right? <laughs> What's the difference? In the me a Methodist is speak to eat the liquor store. Oh, Baptist won't, huh? No. He just pretend like he don't know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. And um, so before we get dive deep into the musket, Ooh, thing, yeah. is that good? That's good stuff. That's good. Um, before we dive deep into that, let's talk a little bit, some show and tell, which we don't have a lot to show, but we got a lot to tell. Got a lot going on with planting for fall right now, and um, we just put out a two-minute tip on Tuesday, planting our pole beans and our Christmas lima running butter beans, and um, those are coming up about that. That be just coming out of the dirt. Mm -hmm. Got a real good germination on them, real good stand. The the key with that when you're planting on top of that tape, that buried tape like that, is you wanna when you first plant, you wanna run that tape for I say at least a good four or five hours oh, just yeah. to soak that seed bed, and you'll get real yeah. good germination. Any of those running bed. butter beans and things like that, you better off plant them in the springtime. That way you can get two or three crops off of them. Yeah, now they'll they'll. They won't do nothing in the heat of summer, but yeah, they'll come they'll back. They'll throw them blooms off when it's hot and dry, and then you just take care of them, talk to them real sweet, and they'll put on another good crop for the fall. That's right. And I'm really excited about these rattlesnake beans. I've seen them and seen people grow them, but I've never grown them myself. Now, I think they lose their pretty color once you cook them or can them, but they look really pretty on the vine. Yeah, it's an old heirloom variety, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, and uh, the Christmas limas, which we've grown several times before, do really well. They're really easy to shell as far as the butter bean goes, and they have kind of a, a nuttier flavor to them than a green butter bean mm -hmm. does. Um, they they preserve really well, they freeze really well, and they make really good soups. Yep, and my time. Seminole pumpkins are doing real good. I planted me a patch of Seminole pumpkins about five weeks ago. And they are really doing good. Uh, if we got a picture, we can show a pair of the Seminole pumpkins. Okay, let's show them what we got. Them things is growing. And I mean, uh, I hadn't had much trouble with mildew, which I normally do yet. So I got my fingers crossed, but I got a real good fruit set on there. And it looks like we're gonna have a bumper crop of Seminole pumpkins. Well, those things are good to eat yep. as well. <clears throat> How many pumpkins do you think you get per plant? On well, average? I don't know. I don't know. It's going to be a lot. I went out there this morning and looked at all the blooms. Them things has got a lot of fruit set on there. More than I can remember having before. Now, they may throw some of them off, but as of right now, we got a lot of them. And they'll be, well, since those things can cure, they'll we'll have them through October. Oh, yeah, yeah. That'll be good. That'll be good. And we've got, as far as the expo goes, we got... Uh, we got taters planted out there, yeah. which we'll just stay tuned for how that goes. Right. Um, we got some flowers planted out there. We got some few rows of zinnias and few rows of celosi or coxcomb planted. Yeah. And uh, we got some cauliflower and okra. We got okra planted out there, some uh, red burgundy okra. And uh, we got lots of things in the greenhouse that are ready to go in mm -hmm. this week. So we're getting full swing at the expo. 
full swing the expo and in our own gardens as well. I've got some lettuce. I'm gonna try to sneak in uh, succession plant here pretty yep. soon too. All right, now let's get into our tool of the week segment. And if I can get this, this is a, one of our bigger tool of the week. If I can get this in the frame here, this right here is what we call our dura rake. And some people call this a landscape rake or a bed prep rake or whatever. So this thing, and I can't get the whole handle in the frame. It's got airplane tube and metal handle on there. So it's really high quality steel there. Really, really nice design. Simple the way it bolts there, the, the handle bolts to the frame, you ain't gonna break this one. And this thing works really good, especially this time of year. I'm getting ready to do me a few beds of those Asian mixed greens, yeah. those smaller greens, where you wanna have your bed prep real nicely because you're trying to get a real good germination rate on your direct seed. Um, also for carrots, stuff like that, some of your stuff that you're real particular about your germination, you want to make sure you got that bed prepped nice. Right. And what I like to do is when I get it just like I want it, I like to flip it over and use that straight edge right there, and that'll make a pretty bed right there on top. That's right. So those tines will work good. You put your little light layer compost down. Those are going to work good, grooving that into your soil a little bit. Then you flip it over like that get it nice and smooth you can run over with your cedar so okay. this is one of the we've we've um before we started carrying a landscape rake or a bed prep rake we brought in a bunch of them mm -hmm. and uh this was the best one we could find right here we're really happy with it you know i don't think we've ever had a complaint I not that so. i know of on them right there we've sold hundreds of them so check that out right there the dura rake and now let's get into our main segment talking about these muscadines. And if, as always, if you have any questions during the show, put those in the comments. We'll be glad to answer them on next week's show. And if we do answer your question, we'll send you something special. How yep. about that? All right. So first of all, let's talk about varieties. Now I've seen some muscadines, like we said before, are staple of the South. They, they grow native down here. We see wild ones all over the place. Um, but there's a lot of people, it, it's not uncommon every two, second or third house down the road's got a muscadine. I, growing up, it seemed like everybody had one yeah. in their backyard. Yeah, actually, they can grow in zones six through 10 pretty well. So anything from the, I'm gonna say from the mid south, uh, heck, I don't know exactly where, from, Central United States on down, you can pretty much grow muscadines. And it's a great thing to have in your backyard because they're very low maintenance. Once you get these babies established, you don't hardly have to do anything to them. So it's, it's, a, it's a good, and it comes in the time of year when everything else is out, so it's great to have and go out there and have you a snack. Because I love to eat them raw off the vine. Yeah, from my research, it seems like the distribution goes anywhere from Florida to, they say, up as north as Delaware. Yeah, but you have to do them a little bit different when you get it back where you have to bank those. In the wintertime, you have to bank them up a little bit. But they cold. grow better in zones 6 through 10. Right, right. They, they're they not going to do well with those prolonged cold temperatures. Yeah. Um, I've seen some places say there was somewhere around 140 varieties some places yeah the little native ones there. or the wild ones that we've got around here that i remember as a boy we still got them in the woods about the size of your thumb now they sweet but they small there's been a lot of cultivation and uh hybridization done on these things and, and a nursery out of northern georgia or around atlanta there called isom's nursery has done a lot of work developing new varieties and we all like the bigger ones for some reason though i do too now they come, you got a, these are the bronze ones. These are my favorite right here. So, and, and we got a video coming out on this, I think next week. So at my house, I've got a vine that's about a hundred foot long and it was there before I moved into this place. And it, it's extreme old vine, big old thick trunks on it, really prolific. And I've got four different varieties out there, four different kind of looking muscadines coming off of it and i want to show everybody so the the first ones here and these are probably the most popular ones you'll see around the south and this is what they call scuppernong mm -hmm. 
And these are these big, we call them bronze ones. They're a little more green than they are bronze. This is probably the most popular one. That was my see. favorite right there. So those are the big bronze ones. They contrast those with these right here, which I've got, which are these small ones. Mm -hmm. Now these small ones, they're good to eat, but you got to eat a lot more of them. Yeah, they grow a lot more of the small ones for wine production for some reason. Though. Now these small ones will grow in these massive clusters. And you basically just get underneath that vine with your picking bucket and just rake them mm -hmm. off in there. These do seem to do better for the wine just because they're you get a lot more of them. Uh, if I'm going to eat them, I'd rather have the big one there. Right. And then... As far as the, uh, I'm not, and like I said, I'm not sure what these are called. I didn't have any funny look with what those are actually called. And then we've got these right here, which a lot of people like as well, which are these Them purple ones. ones. Yep. And we've got a couple different kind of purple ones. So I've got this real big purple one right here. And um, best I can tell, this one is called a coward. Coward, C-O-W-A-R-T? Right. And uh, that's a real big purple one. It's bigger than a quarter. And then I've got these other purple ones. Yeah, They're about half that size. And best I can tell, these are called Noble. Mm -hmm. Now, they, they could be cousins of either of those varieties, but that's my best guess. Uh, I don't know if I could tell the difference in taste if I was blindfolded, but, but I do like those bigger ones there. Yeah. Now, there's a correct way to eat these things. Now, the way we like to eat them is we like to eat them fresh off the vine. Go out there and you just stand there for a while and you eat them. And what you have to do is you have to bite into them and it's got an inside in there that's full of seeds. Mm -hmm. What we do is you bite into it and you get the juice out of it and then you spit the hull out. Then that inside, you got to run it through your teeth there to get them seeds out and then you spit the seeds out. Now, what's going to happen if you eat them seeds? Well, my father, a few years ago, ate him a belly full of them and ate them seeds. He didn't spit them out. And he come down with a case of the terrible diverticulitis. Had to end up in the hospital for a few days. Then them seeds got lodged up in his belly. And from there on, we make it a rule around here. you got to spit them seeds out because you don't want to end up down there with no diverticulitis and things get all hung up in there because they can get infected in this bad business. So you want to spit them seeds out, and the only thing you're going to swallow is the juice and that inside in there without the seeds. That is the proper way to eat it, and I will demonstrate right here. Once you bite on, all that juice will come out of there. Now, if I was outside, I'd be spitting them on the ground, but I'm going to use this right here. Then you take that out. Then you've got to run this through your teeth to get those seeds out. Now, it's a little bit of a trick but once you figure it out, it ain't nothing to it. It's an acquired skill. Mm -hmm. There you go. Well, now, every one of them seeds just come slap out of it. Now, didn't you have, well, I don't know if this was a uh, just a story or truth. Didn't you have an uncle have to go get his stomach pumped? I had, an so uncle, I had an uncle that, there used to be these you pick places around these farms would have four or five acres of them, and you could go out there and you pick. And they charge you so much pound, but now he did what we call grazing. <laughs> he would get out there and he would eat more than what he put in his bucket. And he swallowed him a bunch of seeds, and he ended up having to get his stomach pump because them seeds got messed up in there. He was being a little bit on the hoggy side there, but that learned him a lesson too. And after that, he kind of calmed down on, on swallowing them seeds. Ain't no good to swallow. Now it looks like it's the right thing to do at the moment because it's easy, but you want to get those <laughs> seeds out. That's right. And uh, you have to watch yourself. You find you a good vine that's loaded down. You can spend the thirty minutes out oh, there yeah. easy yeah. eating them things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can uh, you can mess up if you eat too many of them. You kind of have to judge yourself a little bit when you you feel like you're getting enough. You need to quit because you you gorge yourself out. You're asking for trouble on them things. Yeah, yeah. I don't always just pick me a mess of them and go in the house and eat them. Because you like to see you guys spit them seeds out. It's better just to metal, uh, yeah. metal around. Walk I around. like to eat them on the outside, and that way I just go right about my business. And yeah. All right. Well, and um, to talk about, I kind of want to mention this real quick. So the scientific name for muscadines is Vitis rotundifolia. Hmm. Which if we look at what these words mean, it makes plenty of sense. Vitis is the Latin word for vine. 
rotund. If something's rotund, what does that mean? It's round. It's kind of plump. Round, kind plump. Of big. Yeah. And then folia, which kind of refers to foliage. So this is saying a vine with lots of foliage. Yep. And that's exactly what a muscadine vine is. That's your Latin vine. lesson for today, boys. That's exactly what a muscadine vine is. And if you don't keep them things trimmed, they will get out of hand on yeah. you. Yeah, and now we, we'll probably later on go over into a good session when it's time to do it. Normally about February is when you need to trim them. And we'll do a show on how to properly trim those muscadines because there is a proper way to do it. Well, and that is also going to depend a lot on how old your vines are. With your newer vines, you you got to be real particular. There's a certain way you got to yep. do it. You got to leave X amount of growth. Now, with the vines I got, I could get out there with a chainsaw and and probably not do a whole lot of damage. Cause yeah, but we're going to have to talk about the proper way to do it. proper way. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I, I was looking on Stark Brothers' site, and they... Um, when they talked about pruning them, they said you should ruthlessly prune them. Hmm. Uh, and I, I pruned mine back hard last year because they just get, they get so much foliage, I have to, I can't get underneath there to find the, the uh, muscadines or whatever. And uh, I pruned them back hard last year with loppers even. And we had all that rain and they just, you, I can't prune them back far enough. They just grow and grow. There's and grow. two different ways you can plant your muscadines. You can plant them in a trailer situation, in which way yours is, where you stretch out some high tensile line and you plant them on that high tensile line. In a straight line. In a straight line. And that's 90% of the way it's done. However, back in the day, a lot of people used to plant arbors mm -hmm. and they would put four, six, eight posts, whatever, and they would put fence wire on top. And those things would grow on top, and you would go underneath there and reach for a pickle. And that works out great. You don't see that as much anymore. You see it a lot. You underneath the shade, you reach up there and pick them. It's nice to have those arbors. The arbors do not produce as much as the line uh, trellis system does. However, it is it is nice to be able to go underneath there, and it, it adds a little bit to your landscape too. So six of one half dozen of another. And let's talk about muscadines because they are they need pollinators and there's some that self-pollinate and i printed off a little excerpt from the isom site i'm going to read here to explain just a tad bit of that okay muscadine vines are either female or self-fertile you plant them 15 to 20 inches apart female varieties produce larger and sweeter fruit female varieties must be planted within 50 feet of a self fertile variety for cross pollination. Female varieties average 50 to 60 pounds per uh, 50, 50 to 60. That wine got me going here. <laughs> 50 to 60 pounds of fruit per plant. Now, here we go. Self fertile varieties in general produce higher fruit yields. They are self pollinating, which means they will pollinate themselves in any female muscadine within 50 feet. They recommend plant at least one self-fertile for every three female vines. So you need to keep that in mind if you're going to plant some muscadines. Self-fertile muscadines average 50 to 60 to 80 pounds of fruit along with some varieties that even produce more. So I must, out of those four I got, I'm assuming the majority of them are self-fertile. Right. But... There could be one of them in there that's the uh, exactly. female that mm -hmm. the other ones are pollinated. Now, Isom's, and we'll show a link here on Isom's site. It's got worlds of uh, literature and information on their site. So you can do, go there and do your, do your research. And they're located in the south. They know muscadines. They're probably mm -hmm. a good go-to source for it. Now, muscadines are great for making jelly. Of course, making wine. What else can you make out of them? Well, I've drank the juice before. We juiced them just juice, went, yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this wine. To me, it makes one of the best wines out there. It's got, mm -hmm. cause the, you can get the hint or the taste of the fruit go through the process and it actually comes out in the wine. Now, sometimes you have to be careful with this wine because you'll get what we call the zoomies. Now, the zoomies is your word for the day. And I, well, let's put a link up here of zoomies. That way everybody can Google zoomies. It's Z-O-O-M-I-E-S. Okay. I didn't know this word existed until yesterday. But my neighbor had got him a pot belly pig. And he come over yesterday and said he was building a fence in the backyard because his pot belly pig had got the zoomies in the house. And I said, well, watch the zoomies. He said, that's when they go crazy and start running in circles. 
And I got to thinking to myself, you know, I've had the Zoomies before. Yeah. I drank too much of this a couple of times and got the Zoomies. I didn't know what it was called, but it was the Zoomies. Zoomies. So don't drink too much of this here, or you will get you a case of the Zoomies. But it's good stuff. It's healthy. It's good for you. And it's easy and fun to make. All in moderation. All in moderation. That's right. Um, before we, we move on to our questions, I want to touch on one more thing. Because muscadines are native to here, we don't they don't we don't have a lot of disease problems with them. They was actually supposedly, you know, the Spanish settlers who were originally here were growing them, and then when when the English settlers moved in, they kind of learned from them how to grow them. But we don't we don't really have to spray them with anything. Now I've read some things that said when they're young they can use a little bit of magnesium and boron. Um, I've heard the old timers talking about putting Epsom salt, magnesium sulfate on them. That they can, I have seen some symptoms of magnesium uh, deficiency in them, but you don't see it a lot. And if you don't need, if you don't have a magnesium deficiency, you're not doing any good there. Right, right. Because it's only going to, plants only going to take up so much. Right. And, but we can't grow the traditional, like Concord grapes and stuff here because of something called Pierce's disease. Wipes them out. And that's uh, transferred by a sap sucking insect. Yeah, you know, we've had a big influx in the, in the wine making down here in the last few years. A lot of wineries went up, and a lot of them have tried to grow those grapes, and they have to keep them saturated with fungicides. If they are halfway successful with it, it's only because they spray fungicides on a regular basis and they just have to stay after it. For the homeowner, you're wasting your time trying to grow you a Concord grape in the South. Yeah, because you can plant the muscadines <clears throat> once they get established. All you got to do is prune them. You ain't yep. got to do nothing else to yep. them. So uh, if you've got muscadines, let us know in the comments there. Tell us what's your favorite variety. I wish I knew what varieties I had, but uh, we'll just have to just enjoy them as they are. Yeah. And we've got a neat video coming, I, I, I say, I think it's next week, and um, where we're going to show kind of our the beginning of our wine making process where we start crushing them we got this little wheel thing that crushes them and then we got a neat little thing called a bladder press that squeezes the juice out of them mm -hmm. and uh, we got some really good footage of that that uh, i think everybody's gonna really enjoy yep. all right so now let's get into our q a segment this week and uh if we answer your question this week send mm -hmm. us your address to Customer serve at hostools.com, and we're going to send you a copy of this book right here called Decoding Gardening Advice. And this is a real good book, and this kind of goes in place with what a lot of what we do on this show, where we try to explain old wives' tales and myths and, and kind of break them down and and uh, find the truth there. So, a really good book here. So we answer your question this week. We'll send you one of these, and then next week's show we'll have another surprise for. Uh, people who comment on this week's show. So David Montgomery sent us in a question. I have some Indian corn that I am about to pick for selling at a farmer's market this fall. Do you have any suggestions for keeping the weevils out of it while I store it for a couple of weeks? Well, David, let me tell you a couple things you can do. One of them is you can, if you got room, you can bag it and put it in your freezer and that'll take care of them. If you leave it in your freezer for two or three days or a week, that will bust that cycle up on them weevils. That's it, assuming it's already dry. That's assuming it's already dry, but it will actually dry it out just a little bit. So if you're not quite at the moisture level uh, you want to be, that freezer will dry it out just a little bit, but you do need it pretty dry before you put it in there. That is the best way. Now, if you do not have room in the freezer, what we have done in our greenhouse, because we don't have a greenhouse full right now, I, I take my corn and I, I put it out on top of my wire and I put a fan on it. I can't tell you why, but that seems to take care of the weevil problem for the time being. Now, as soon as we take this stuff and, and, and take it out of that situation, the weevils can come back. So it doesn't necessarily bust a cycle, but there's something about that, that taking the moisture away and putting that fan on there and that heat on that chicken wire, that will, the weevils will stop eating the corn. So either one of the two things is what I'd recommend. There's some other options out there you could fumigate it, but the normal person don't have access to do that. So either put it in your freezer or put it out there on an area that's make sure it's out of the, out of the rain where no moisture get to it, 
put you a fan on there and it was some good hot air and that'll take care of a lot of those wiggles too. That fan just seems to just deter them. And, just and it dries your corn out too, so that's good. And then what, once you got it dry, if it's not already dry like yours, you can go ahead and shell it and put it in the freezer. It's going to take up a lot less room. Yeah, but that in Indian corn, he won't sit on the cob, so he can sell it at the farm. Oh, right. I got you. On the yeah. cob, I got you. I got you. All right. So, David, send us uh, your address, and we'll get that book out to you. And then the last one, we got a question from another David. This is from David H., and he wants to know, uh, you know, we talked a lot about seed trays and planting seeds last week. He wants to know, when using our seed trays, are there certain varieties that we would skip a cell or two to give room for the seedlings uh, without getting leggy or tangled together? And I, um, so this is some scarlet kale here. Everybody see that? That we've got that's ready to go in. And we never skip a cell. You know, for, and I can't explain why I get it again, but now if you skip a cell, it seems to make it worse to me than you do if you fill it all the way up. Well, the problem is going to be you can't fill every other cell with dirt. So you're going to be wasting some potting soil. First of all, if you skip a cell, it's easier to go ahead and plant a whole tray than it is to plant every other one. And you can see these are pretty thick in here, but we can pull them right out of there. Look at there. That's a pretty, mm, that's pretty, just right, right there. That's a pretty transplant. See them roots mm, growing down mm. right there. Yep. That's so the short answer, David, is no. Plant that tray full and utilize every bit of it. I've even seen some of the commercial guys. They use um, trays with cells a quarter this size. You know, 500 plants on the same size tray, and they don't ever have any problems with yeah. it. So uh, fill up that whole tray. You don't use it all, give it to your neighbor. Yeah. Something another. Make sure you use the whole tray. Yep. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's show, folks. And uh, we will see you guys on next week's show. Have a good one. And watch out for them zoomies. <laughs>